uh, welcome everybody uh, to our webinar on sales kickoffs. And uh, we know this is a sales kickoff season, so we are very happy to do a webinar on what are some of the things that we can actually help you with to think about to make SKO a kickoff a success for the year. And uh, before we actually begin, um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Obviously, we'll be recording and sending this out to you and everybody else who uh, may not be able to attend fully. Um, there is a chat box on the, I guess, the right hand side, we assume. Feel free to submit your questions anytime and uh, we will answer them as we go. Um, and then I believe we have one or two polls um, set throughout the, the uh, webinar itself. So definitely participate. It's going to help us tremendously in terms of identifying what topics and uh, conversations that we actually want to have with you um, in the future. And so um, I'm going to introduce you to our speaker today, Dave. Um, but before we do, um, my name is Vincent. I am the VP of Product Marketing here, and I'm going to be your host. Uh, so, David. Hey, I'm uh, Dave Washer. I work on the customer success side at Clue. Um, I'm really excited to be here today. I get a lot of questions throughout rollout um, to figure out what's the right message you want to get to salespeople. What are the things that you can do to really help people be engaged with your content? Um, so I'm excited to be here because I have experience helping people and coaching them through this. And Vincent has the experience of actually doing this live. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> a lot. But tell us a little bit about your anti-money laundering bit. What's that about? Oh, yeah. I'm against it. I, uh, I, I don't like it. And you worked in anti-money laundering before. Yes. What was that? Yeah. Uh, I worked at the oh. Bank of Montreal in anti-money laundering. And I ran an investigation team, which actually drew me to intelligence gathering and those kinds of things. Really? That's super interesting. And did you have to do any sales kickoffs about that? I did different kinds of kickoffs because we launched a whole bunch of new initiatives internally. So it was largely the same process. Um, and really just about how do we get people engaged in, in dealing with a new process or a new type of information and consuming it well. You are very well suited for this uh, talk then. All right. Well, when we think about SKO, you know you've got your 15 minutes of fame, but in reality, how much time do you have on stage? Five seconds sometimes. Yeah, yeah. you got five minutes to 15 minutes. And what you need to do is you need to lay out whatever your marketing or your content needs are for that entire year. Um, and you have to bring people along with you. So you've got 15 minutes to pack your entire year in. Um, so we're going to help you with some tips on how to do that and keep your audience engaged. And like I said, quick agenda, uh, we'll go through some top interactive elements that have worked for our clients today. Um, the focus uh, of all the messaging should be with that sales lens. How can a salesperson use this? Because SKO is all about the salespeople. And then how to bring people along and show your vision for the year to the field so that they're going to understand it and they can take and help you execute throughout the year. And so before we really dive in, I think one of the really interesting things that we want to know from you is what topics are you presenting at this year's SKO? Uh, we're going to put the poll up, um, but David, like, tell us what are some of the topics that your clients uh, will be speaking to this year? Yeah, and, and this is a broad range and it really depends on what stage your company's in. Uh, we've seen people do complete rebrandings at SKO. Mm -hmm. So the major focus for that is really just making sure the new messaging and the new positioning is out there and making sure people understand it. So when you're presenting that kind of topic, you need to make sure that you are on point with that messaging. Yeah. One of my experiences has been a whole 30 seconds of which I was basically presented as, hey, Vincent is the new uh, compete guy for us <laughs> as a company. And it was a steady ovation, but that was it. Like I didn't have to say a single thing. So that was the extent of that particular SKO. Yeah, I was just like an anecdotal side note. Anybody who says we're going to give you competitive information about a sales <laughs> kickoff, boom, you win. All right. So let's take a look at. Let's still look at the results. Yeah, let me go back. Sorry. There we go. There we go. Let's see. Oh, there are almost fifty percent are presenting on a brand new product offering, uh, which is very challenging at some yeah. point, um, but you also get a lot of attention naturally, I think. Oh yeah. Um, and I think a good majority, 40% are actually presenting about the competitive landscape and competitive takedown campaign. So that's a great lead into what we want to talk about and, and show you today. Awesome. So 
I got to get these mouse maneuvers figured out, but I'll figure it out by the end of this. Uh, objective number one, make it engaging. Uh, be like Britney Spears in the 90s, really captivate the audience, bring them in. Um, but I think she was bored here. <laughs> yeah, she was bored, but the audience watching her was very, very interested, and that's the important piece. Yeah. So when we think about presentations, uh, you're going to have a lot of people distracted and it's just something to be aware of. Um, so you wanna have people focus. So I, the, I think the stat out there is about 50% of people are doing something else during a pre Come on, man. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Seriously? Sorry. 50%, 50%. 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50% of the stats. So in reality, you wanna make sure that your presentations are engaging and uh, that they can bring in an interactive element. Another one. <laughs> this is the audience you want. They're standing up, they're all engaged, and although this looks sort of cliche, everybody there is participating and that's pretty gold, especially when you're talking about corporate. Yeah, and, and I think a lot of people do this, right? Like right off the bat of their presentation, they're gonna do a show of hands type of topic to get people engaged. Um, very common, and it gets people to participate, but I think there's more than that. Yeah, definitely more than that. And uh, maybe what we'll do is walk through some of the key things that people have done in uh, SKOs to help interact with the audience when they do have that 10 minutes. So audience challenges is really referring to uh, how do you engage the audience along the way and bring them on on the different topics that you're going to be uh, showing. One, and this was one we've seen across the board with multiple people, it's a treasure hunt challenge. So odds are you've got a PowerPoint deck or something. Um, we've seen people put little indicators in the bottom right corner of a PowerPoint deck and say, hey, first person to find this type of information on the drive or in our internal database or in Clue um, wins a $5 gift card for Starbucks. So really quick, easy thing, put a little prize in the bottom. You can often find out who got there first and uh, create a notification system. And $5 gift card is all it takes. <laughs> yeah, anybody will do anything for coffee. <laughs> so it's a little bit gimmicky, but literally $5 gift cards is enough. And I, I gotta be honest with you, it's more of the bragging right to be like, I got the $5 right, right, gift right, right. card. Right. So it's almost like the sales kickoff version of a bingo card. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Um, we've seen this done with mobile activities to say, I need people to use mobile more often. Um, so the treasure hunt challenge could be to download and install an app and send the, be the first person to send a confirmation that you've installed the app. You usually get about 20 or 30 people to do that depending on the size of the room. The next one we've seen is one that more geared towards uh, competitive, um, but it's actually for Basically, whoever, as long as you have a piece of content or you want to generate information from the audience. So the discovery question challenge is, what are the questions uh, that your salespeople are using that are helping them, you know, really identify the pains of the customer and do that? Everybody's got their list of discovery questions. Everybody got their go-to. So there's always somebody willing to share. Um, basically, any content or topic that you can guarantee you're going to get some audience participation for, you can create a challenge around it. And that creates that sharing environment and the relationship between sales that they know they can send information to you. So this is kind of like having the, um, the presenter kind of run down to the audience and stick a mic in their heads and in front of their faces and say, hey, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. I've sat in a room, we had uh, 35 people um, in a bunch of different remote locations and we actually used Clue for this. So they would comment on the battle card, but you could think about doing it on the drive as well. If someone just added a comment saying, here's what I know of this, or here's a good discovery topic. And then storytelling face-offs. Uh, this is a favorite, but you do need to plant some people <laughs> in the audience just to make sure. Um, so what I have done in the past is we've said, okay, do we have a bunch of good clue stories? And can we get people to like face off and talk about them? So if you've got a few people who have won a deal because of compete materials or won a deal because of your materials, um, or at least use your materials to help convince a client over an objection. Those are the stories that really impact because we'll go through this a little bit later, but when you put it in the context of how a salesperson can use it um, and you show them that their teams are actually using it, that's going to be a major, major win. So how hard is it for you to get uh, participants and how early do you have to do it? Um, I would say probably do it uh, uh, 
Yeah, it's a good question. I, I would argue it's somewhere in the middle and it's a way to re-engage after you've done your kickoff because you're going to open your presentation. You're probably going to have a hook to bring people in. Mm -hmm. And this is a good way to re-engage with the audience after you've given them some media information. Okay. Good to know. So the next and probably most significant challenge is getting salespeople to care. When you're doing a presentation, the, uh, the fun part, and, and this is sort of like, uh, what, it, what is that word? It's not an actual stat, but it's sort of like things people... I think it's, it's an actual stat, but okay. we've actually seen it from Microsoft research. Ah, okay. So the question is, where did that actual stat come from in their research? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and the idea is, no matter what of the reality of this stat, when you're in a presentation, you've got a finite time of how much focus you've got from the team. Um, so you'd be better off presenting to goldfish than you would be <laughs> presenting to anybody else. Well, a goldfish can't go anywhere else. Yeah, exactly. They just swim around. They'll forget. You can tell them over and over again. So this is a slide uh, that's really about bringing together the product team and the salespeople. So when you think about product and salespeople, there's often a divide right? between salespeople always ask me for this and product people never deliver that. Uh, what I like to do is go a step back, and as you talk to a salesperson, their goal is to drive revenue for the company. Uh, when you talk to a product person, their goal is to drive revenue for a company. So it's often just a relationship that often needs mending. And so when you're thinking of your presentation, understand what their focus, what their pains are, just like you would any other customer, and treat them like the customer. Mm -hmm. Um, it'll help you. It also helps build that relationship and feedback and you'll often see they'll treat you like a customer as well or at least someone who's a stakeholder involved in helping them win more deals. So tips to think like a salesperson. Use cases. My, uh, my favorite go-to is we had a customer tell us a story where a field agent was sitting face-to-face -face with a prospect. Um, the prospect just brought up an objection that we knew what, or they knew was from the competitor. Uh, the prospect then had to leave the room to go to the bathroom. And while the prospect was in the washroom, the salesperson reached into their phone, pulled up Clue, found the objection in the Clue app. Uh, and then when the prospect came back, they were able to refute the claim and that actually resulted in closing the deal. Um, think about the impact that would have for any salesperson. If you use these materials that we're creating, you can win more deals. Right. It's a very tangible use case where they can say, I'm a salesperson, I know exactly what scenario that was, I can use it in that scenario. Right. So, so it's really about highlighting those uncommon use cases, like you know, not the typical scenario that people would naturally think about already, right? Yeah, and it's, it's elevating past that, go to the drive, click on this, here is your battle card. Mm -hmm. It's like, why are you gonna go to the drive? Right. Why where are you, you gonna go to the win? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and if you have any other use cases where you've heard things uh, or these stories, share them in the chat, please do. Uh, use impactful numbers. So outside of use cases, you have to remember you're communicating to a large group of people, whether it's 30 or 100, so people consume information differently. If I tell a use case, not everyone's going to believe it or latch onto it, so sometimes you need to go with the numbers approach too. And I actually like to mix a bit of both when I do these types of presentations. Impactful numbers being how do teams perform who use this information versus who don't. Um, in our case, we've actually been able to show people, uh, users who use Clue actually have a higher win rate than people who don't. And so that is a very powerful message for salespeople and sales leadership to say, you need to use these materials because they're gonna help you with the deal. I've done actually something very similar. Um, what we've actually looked at it and presented was really two numbers. One number that was the number of, uh, sorry, the win rate when the competition was actually known compared to the uh, win rate when the competition is not known. And then we just added it to the topic that, well, did you know that only 30% of our deals have opportunities and, and competition identified? And people just thought, I'm going to just start that and say, okay, I think I need to know what I need to do next. Yeah. And those are, the, those are the things that really drive engagement of like ongoing. We can simply say that and then there's always uh, one additional aspect to this is when you can present these numbers, guess who jumps on board and guess what you should really use in your presentation. Um, 
I guess the question is, who listens to sales leadership? Everybody listens to sales leadership. If there's a problem, they're gonna be able to say it. If there's a solution, they're going to be able to share it from the rooftops. So when you can get impactful numbers and you can get champions behind you who in the leadership position, get them to share it and say it. One of our customers, uh, an executive sales leader uh, at the top, saw the uh, with using content versus without using content. Um, and then all of a sudden sent an email to the entire sales team and said, if you're not using Clue, you are not all there, <laughs> for lack of a better way to say it. And objective three, setting up success for the year. Uh, this is largely focused on bringing people along with you uh, in the journey. Ah, so, so second poll that we actually have, a second question we actually have for everybody. Um, and the question is, what departments will your CI plans and strategy actually touch this year? Um, just marketing? Just sales? Beyond that, what does it actually look like? Can you, David, can you actually tell us like what that typical path is for our customers in terms of where they start with CI and where they go? Uh, the answer is it always starts with a sales lens, especially when it comes to compete, but there's definitely okay. driving factors. So if you're doing a competitive enablement um, type approach to CI, what you'll have is salespeople will feed you back a bunch of information. Always worth starting with sales to say, are these the competitors we're seeing? But also connecting that with the marketing groups to say, uh, is this who actually we should be competing against? Because there's sometimes you end up uh, with a bit of a mix. So there's a lot of people engaged along the way of developing your CI strategy for the year. Mm -hmm. Let's see. The numbers are not all that surprising, I guess. Um, the large majority are field sales, inside sales, and marketing oriented with uh, additional support into product and executive teams. Yeah, and field sales is actually quite interesting because there's so many companies, especially in the B2B tech space, that have more inside sales than field sales. Mm -hmm. So the enabling field sales has been something where uh, we've had a lot of hits because field sales is really just on their mobile all mm -hmm. the time. Um, so making sure things are mobile friendly is just something to consider in that right. space. Well, even for inside sales, I think the mobile friendliness really comes into play as well because a lot of inside sales are going to be presenting on a Zoom like this. Oh, yeah. And on the side, they might actually have their phone that they can actually quickly flip through and look at things and look for things. Yeah, actually, that's been a use case we've talked to a lot of people about because often as an inside salesperson, you have a laptop. And so if you're sharing your screen, you can't look up anything. So if someone asks you something, you're sort of caught off guard. But if you have your phone, well, welcome to dual screen because we actually have computers in our hands. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can very easily pull up any materials from there. And I have seen people with the cut eye being like, oh yeah, but they're actually looking <laughs> at their phone to respond to something. Great. So this is, this is one that uh, touches home. Um, especially from my previous role in the Bank of Montreal, we ruled out a lot of initiatives. Uh, some were successful, some were not. And there were a lot that had to do with, you know, how we engaged with the groups along the way and how we told the story. So understand that when you are doing change management, it is a process and it should be a major focus of launching any initiative or, or any change in messaging mm -hmm. because you're going to have to bring people along with you. So hot tip, bring them along for the journey. That's very hot tip, very, very important. Uh, in reality, well, it, is, it is so, so yeah. very important um, because if you don't have them uh, with you and you don't have them bought in, they will fade off very quickly. And by they, I'm referring to any user you're trying to engage with. Um, when it comes to SKO, tie into the key SKO message. If you're doing a major product rebrand, how does this apply to them? Uh, what is the sort of outlook for content that you're going to be building in the future? And how does that tie into the overall SKO message of the new brand? Yeah. Um, or from what we saw earlier today, like a large number are looking at launching new products. So what is the SKO message around why the company is launching a new product? What yeah. markets are being launching to? Yeah, what markets? Is this a new vertical? How do we how do we do this? And then what are you going to be doing about this over the year to help enable them to win more deals? 
Uh, road, oh, I already stole this one, but roadmap for execution is so, so important. So what we see people do is they come in and they say, competitive materials are important. We're going to have compete. We're going to build out this stuff. Uh, and then two months go by and nothing came. So you burn uh, that, that engagement you had at SKO very quickly by not having a roadmap for execution. So when can they expect it? Um, and what can they expect? And one of the things I've seen work really well is you may have 40 new marketing materials created or 10 different compete decks already set up. But what works really well is say, here's the three that are most important for your tier ones. Every two weeks, launch an extra one, launch an extra one and use it as a drip campaign afterwards. Mm -hmm because then you have that constant engagement and they feel like you're really doing everything you can to support them. Yeah. Um, one of the major things, I think you've employed this at uh, Hootsuite. Yeah, um, it's, it's definitely really two prong approach, right? One is showing a roadmap for future commitments. And the second is instill this, this um, curiosity into the audience so that they're always constantly thinking about, well, what's gonna come next? When is it gonna come? And when it actually comes, what's actually gonna be there? So the roadmap for execution really like plays two roles here. Yeah, one of the other things it does is it gives people the ability to contribute back to it. So if they look at it and they say, that's not a competitor we're actually coming up against. <laughs> that happens too. Yeah, and it's like, oh my goodness, thank you, because I was about to spend two weeks building out that battle card and that was not going to be useful for anybody. Yeah, yeah. Or the other side, which is, here's a roadmap of all the competition that we're going to look at, and then someone yeah. actually goes up and says, well, actually, there's somebody else that you need to look at as well. That's also a huge input that you really need. Yeah, exactly. And the more consistent you can make that uh, repeat mechanism, the better you can actually plan your work. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, just as a side note, one of the biggest things that I hear from product marketers is it's so hard to plan because you get demands from absolutely every angle. And so you are always struggling to make sure that you can execute on what you're actually supposed to be doing. Uh, and this one always, always wins because if you have something um, that you can provide that's going to provide more insight, uh, this works well. With Clue, it's been one of those things where people are saying, we're going to do competitive materials and we're going to make them super easy to access through this new tool we're bringing out. We're going to have a bunch of different trainings on this and so on. But the main thing is, how do we put competitive information in your hands wherever you are? Mm -hmm. um, and that has always hit well. Are there any other tools that you've rolled out uh, or any examples you can bring up? Well, I was actually going to say, like, it, sometimes it's not about a new tool. Sometimes it's just the same tool that is needs to be reinforced or reminded, mm -hmm. right? Like, one of the things I've always done in either kickoff or onboarding is say, you know what? I recognize that you're not going to remember a single thing that I've actually said for the past 15 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour or so. All you have to remember is to go here, this particular tool, to do this or get this information. That's the only thing I want them to remember, and that's the only thing they need to remember. Yeah, I've heard that from so many people and I was actually just reading an academic paper about the importance of the pain or gain at the end in driving what people are actually going to do. Uh, and so honestly, end with the bang. Don't worry about what I said before. Here's where the information is gonna be. Keep it simple. Exactly. So key takeaways, uh, make things intera interactive with the audience challenges. So whether you're doing mobile searches or anything like that, absolutely find a way to interact and engage with the audience, it'll help. Um, when you're writing content, remember that audience is all salespeople. So you have to have that salesperson lens on it so they understand why you're doing it and how it can help them. That's gonna really translate into engagement going forward. And, and then use a the language that they understand and they will not naturally speak. Precisely, precisely. Uh, and then show, don't tell them the roadmap. Basically uh, have it laid out for them, let them know what's gonna come. And then make sure you execute on that because that's going to reinforce. Thanks, everybody. I think. Uh, yeah, so uh, we are going to answer any questions that you have. If you have any questions, feel free to add it to the chat. Um, questions, examples, scenarios, anything. Scenarios actually would be super interesting. Yeah. That's all I really want to hear about. Um, you know what? Since we have a couple more minutes and we're seeing some questions trickle in, can you give a couple more examples of those those uh, use cases, of the box use cases that are very meaningful for kickoffs? Yeah, well, one of the ones is uh, there's always different groups of salespeople. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got your development team who's going to be on the phones all day, the 15 minute calls to bring in the leads. 
you've got your account execs, um, you actually have your customer success people too. Um, so from a uh, development rep's perspective, we've actually found that they like the news a lot. Um, and they use the news to engage with prospects to say, hey, this happened in your space, what's going on? Or, hey, this competitor is doing something here, how are you going to respond to it? Um, and we've seen this countless times. Uh, the, the development reps are actually really engaged from that perspective. Mm -hmm. And so if you can give them the use case, that works very well to right, uh, right. engage with that audience. Right. right. Oh, there's another question here. Um, the question is, what is valuable to show as it relates to market landscape and changes in it and keeping it still relevant to salespeople? Um, I think a little bit of the high level, understanding that um, people are in deals and it's a bit more of a tactical scenario, mm -hmm. um, but helping them understand that strategic um, piece. What I can say is there's a lot of people talking about cloud right now, uh, but not everything about the cloud space is something a salesperson needs to know. So boiling it down to what cloud means to a salesperson mm -hmm. so that they can talk intelligently to a client about how client, cloud applies to their product, right, right. that's largely where it is. So right. boil it up to the campaign level and then always put that sales lens on it of how can they use this in the deal to help them. Yeah, yeah. Um, or another way that, that that language that I always use is here's the impact to you. Exactly. Yeah. Sometimes it could be here's the impact to you, which is none. Or sometimes it, here's the impact to you, which is fairly minor, and here's what you do with it, right? So that's the way that I always use in terms of answering that question. Yeah. Okay. Another question, um, what are other ways I can remind a team right after and again throughout the year? So, 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 so many. And this is actually one where it's, uh, uh, we've seen sales enablement uh, teams be a huge asset in this respect. So when you're rolling out an initiative, one group to engage with along the way um, is definitely about keeping your sales enablement team aware of advancements and then training. Um, so we've seen regular trainings from sales enablement like once a quarter for either all new hires uh, or refreshers for existing hires to remind them. Mm -hmm. It really helps to, to, to build yeah, engagement. Yeah. And also use sales leaders. It's sales leaders. Yeah. That's critical, absolutely yeah. critical. Uh, one other question. How to build trust with the sales team when you're launching a new product for a new segment? Oh, that is That's a, a fun doozy. One. Yeah. That's a fun one. You want to take that? Uh, I'll jump in. Okay, okay, yeah. good. Okay. Um, so I think one of the things that you really want to do in terms of getting excitement and getting trust is to build it ahead of time. You can always bring in and, and get some of the top sales people, loop them in keep it relatively confidential, obviously, but loop them in and then have their take on things and then have them tell the rest of the salespeople what their take is, how they're going to use it, et cetera, right? Really using almost this, this internal social proof that you could um, help to build that trust and create that trust. I would say a bit of it too is when you're developing that new product for a new market, the answer is they're not, if, if you're struggling to get that message across, maybe they don't understand why we're building that product. And so keeping that message aligned with, you know, why are we building this product? And that could be bringing that someone from the product team who helped develop it to say, what are the markets we're trying to create? What are the verticals? How can this apply? And what are the use cases? Um, and what I think it is when I've talked to salespeople is they were thrown something, they don't really know how to use it. And that's where the trust is broken because they just don't know how to actually apply what the new thing is. Yeah. Again, it's, it's back to that point of thinking like a salesperson in terms of what they need to understand how it impacts mm -hmm. them and how they could actually use it. I've actually done uh, uh, surveys with salespeople to say, when you've rolled out something and you get that feel mm -hmm. um, that they may not be taking it in, uh, you've got a few trusted advisors, or I'm assuming you do, just go and talk to them and see what's the feel. How did people take that content in? And maybe there is just something misconstrued in the messaging that might need to be tweaked. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. One, one thing that I really like to do is to have a regular cadence of internal surveys, mm -hmm. uh, sur surveys to the sales teams about their confidence level. Confidence level in terms of pitching, confidence level in terms of depositioning, confidence level in handling objections, confidence levels in terms of being able to speak to the capabilities of the product and customer needs. And if you're doing that on our, over a regular basis, you're naturally building trust over the long haul so that when you are launching a new product into a new segment, um, the sales team will have thought about it and would have understood that you have kept their needs in mind. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, the one other example that I have of that is, and it's not one other example, most of our customers actually have quarterly reviews with a group of sales teams that we've referred to as like SWAT meetings. Um, but it's what's happening in the market, what are they hearing, what do they need. Um, and when you do it on quarterly cadence, you get one, that engagement going forward, mm -hmm. uh, and two, the feedback you need to really define your roadmap and make sure you're executing on the right things. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question, a couple more questions rolling in. Um, this one is fun. I know you and I can actually speak to this a lot. If you're rolling out the new battle cards in time for SKO, to what level of detail should you be talking about them if you have time to present? Oh, pretty high level. Uh, as in, like we said in that last piece, keep it simple and roll it up. They're not gonna remember the information. Um, what I have seen, I guess what I would say is, when you got the 15 minute slot, very, very high level of what information you have, what's coming, and how, here's how to check it out. If you've got an hour, uh, you're probably gonna be requested to do a bit of a deep dive. So deep dive into the most meaningful aspect of those battle cards of what are the really meaty um, pieces that you can really help salespeople elevate. Yeah, team. totally. Keep it super high level and use it as an opportunity to hook the salespeople in so that they're coming into it immediately after your talk. Precisely. Yeah. One other question. Would you show competitive data in order to compare it to your solution product or would you leave it to after meeting deep dive? I think I would leave it to an after meeting deep yeah. dive. And when you're creating comparisons, um, you really want to know how to talk about it. Uh, salespeople and, and, and like, they'll always want the feature to feature comparison <laughs> and how they differentiate. And that's not really what you want to get into. So when you're thinking of comparisons, always roll it up to that value conversation. So yes, we have this, uh, um, yes, they have this, but why is our overall platform and solution going to be better for this client? Okay, let's see, uh, are there other questions coming up? Nope, okay. Well, we're gonna hang around for a couple more minutes um, before to answer any additional questions. Uh, otherwise, thank you for everybody's time.